Welcome everybody to everybody joining all across the world to another Global Immuna Talk. My name is Laura McKay. I'm from the Doherty Institute at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And it's my absolute pleasure on behalf of the 2022 Global Immuna Talk organizers to introduce today's speaker, um, Dr. Franca Ronchese. Just before I introduce our Global Immuna Talk speaker for today, I'd just like to remind everybody that the questions will be conducted by Twitter um, and I'll display a slide at the end of our talk just with instructions on the handle you need um, to ask the questions following the talk. And also to remind you that next week's speaker um, will have Le Guan Un, so um, tune in next week for that. So this week, today, um, we're so excited um, to have Franca with us. Welcome. Franca is a professor and program leader at the Maligan Institute of Medical Research in Wellington in New Zealand. Franca is originally from Italy, where she trained prior to joining the lab of Ron Germain for her postdoctoral studies at NIH. Following that, Franca went on to in her independent program, first at the Basel Institute in Switzerland, um, after that, moving to the Maligan in 1994, where she's become really well known in um, looking at dendritic cell responses and how they prime CD4 cells, particularly um, in the setting of allergy, which is what she'll talk about um, to us today. So, Franca, before you talk, um, as you know, um, tradition at Global Immunotalks is to let our audience get to know you a little bit better. So what we would really love to know from you um, and hopefully to inspire us all is what advice would you give your 25 to 35 year old self? Thank you so much, Franca. Um, uh, good morning, Laura. Thank you for the introduction. Um, it's uh, so long since I was 25 to 35 that I'm not sure how much of the advice I can give now would be relevant uh, today. But for some really generic uh, advice, I'd say if I look at myself and how I felt uh, about myself at that time, uh, be more confident, believe in yourself and in your ideas. Um, you are not necessarily wrong because your senior colleagues have different ideas. Um, don't try to do it all yourself. Uh, you have many decisions to take about your career, your research and so on. It's important to find a mentor you feel comfortable talking to uh, about your career and the decisions you're facing and that can give you some advice. And then, uh, yeah, work hard and more importantly, work smart. You want to be productive. Be sure you learn the latest technology because technology drives advances and uh, keep your eye on the big picture. You cannot win all the battles. You would need to win the war and uh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, there's so many great nuggets in there. I um, really appreciate all of them. And I'm sure um, so many of our listeners here today do as well. So we're so excited for your talk. Um, can't wait uh, to listen to what you've got in store for us today. So if you can share your slides, um, we'll let you take it away. Okay. Oh, so sorry, sorry, sorry. I need to, 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 to share screen. Yeah, a yeah, yeah. And now I need to, Okay, That's perfect. perfect. I'll find my pointer. Uh, here we go. Yeah. yeah, so thank you, Laura, again. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to speak as part of this program. It's really an honor, and I've enjoyed some all the talks I've uh, seen so far. So it's uh, really exciting to be part of this. And uh, today I would like to talk to you about our work on dendritic cells and about uh, what I think is still a really important uh, question in immunology, which is uh, how do dendritic cells uh, initiate a TH2 immune responses? And uh, we all know that dendritic cells are important and essential for T helper cell differentiation and uh, provide a number of signals that are important for T cell activation and proliferation, such as antigen and co-stimulatory signals. And more important, also uh, importantly, also produce cytokines. Cytokines, which are 
generically uh, defined as a signal three in immunology and uh, are important for uh, directing the differentiation of uh, these T helper cells to different effect of phenotypes. The dritic cells produce these cytokines upon uh, uh, recognition of uh, various microbial components via surface receptors, such as toll-like receptors uh, or other pattern recognition receptors. And these cytokines are, as I said, important in directing this uh, T-cell differentiation. Of course, uh, when dendritic cells are exposed to infectious agents in tissues, uh, are all, dendritic cells are also sensing whatever happens uh, in the environment uh, that surrounds them. And there can be tissue-specific factors, for example, that condition dendritic cells to some types of immune responses and uh, other cytokines that are also induced by the same uh, uh, microbial agents in the surrounding tissue. So basically dendritic cells have uh, the job of uh, uh, integrating all this information that is provided uh, by the environment, by the infection agent itself and conveying to the T cells. Now we understand the quite a bit about the signals that dendritic cells provide to T cells to drive their differentiation into either Th1 interferon gamma producing T cells. We know that IL-12 produced by the dendritic cells is extremely important in this process and also both directly by acting directly on the T cells and indirectly by driving the production of interferon gamma by innate T cells. And similarly, for the priming of uh, Th17 cells that produce IL-17 and IL-22, factors such as IL-6, IL-23, and TGF-beta, which are also either produced or uh, converted to an active form, such as for TGF-beta by dendritic cells, the signals that dendritic cells provide is quite clear. What is less clear is what happens in the case of Th2. We know that uh, Th2 cells uh, require IL-2 and IL-4. These IL-2 and IL-4 are presumably produced by the T cells themselves, are almost certainly produced by the T cells themselves. And what we still don't know is what signals does the dendritic cell uh, provide uh, to support the uh, production of these cytokines and uh, perhaps repress the production of other cytokines. We still don't know if, it's, uh, if there is a soluble factor involved uh, or other types of signals or whether it is simply a default differentiation. Now, one question uh, that uh, comes up from looking at uh, this variety of functions that dendritic cells can fulfill is how do they manage to do all this and how can they carry out such different functions. And uh, this is actually a question that is still um, uh, debated to some extent for, and controversial. For example, uh, one possibility is that, that there are different dendritic cell subsets, and we know that dendritic cells come in many flavors, and that each of these subset is, subsets uh, can spe specialize in inducing different types of uh, uh, Th immune responses. So we, and there is some evidence for this. Uh, for example, we know that different subsets of dendritic cells express different uh, uh, toll-like receptors at their surface. So they are activated by different types of pathogens. And we know that they also are maybe predisposed to produce uh, more or less of a certain cytokines. For example, IL-12 beta is expressed uh, already a steady state by DC1s and not DC2s, and that uh, may be important. So this is one possibility. And the other extreme is uh, instead uh, the opposite, that uh, the dif these different responses of dendritic cells are driven by antigen signaling, uh, that uh, a population of dendritic cells, which is able to sense uh, by using different receptors, different types of pathogens, will be instructed by this signaling to express different cytokines that then uh, result in the differentiation of different T helper cells. So basically, the dendritic cell is plastic and will uh, change uh, its response depending on the signal it receives. And then on top of this, uh, I think we need to keep in mind that, that the tissue environment in which the dendritic cells are found may also have a role. And this might be important regardless of whether this or this is the case. So to try to start uh, to 
take apart uh, this question, we decided to create a, what is a really a, a simple system in which uh, we uh, decided, uh, we picked uh, three different uh, uh, inactivated pathogens uh, or uh, commensal uh, uh, or microorganisms, mycobacteria, which induce st strong interferon gamma responses, inactivated larvae of uh, Nipostrongylus brasiliensis, which is an nematode parasite that induces a strong IL-4 response, and then uh, candida albicans, so again, inactivated, which induces some Th17 responses. We took these microorganisms, which are complex and can engage both the innate and adaptive immune response, and uh, labeled them with fluorochromes. So, and injected them into mice all via the same route uh, through the ear skin. And uh, the plan of this experiment was to see whether we could find the dendritic cells that take up these fluorescent antigens and uh, how do they change using both flow cytometry and transcriptomics. And then also measure the CD40 cell response that they induce, because of course you cannot uh, assess dendritic cell function without, without looking at T cell responses. The idea uh, being that if we can modify the dendritic cell response, how will this uh, uh, result uh, in changes in the T cell response? And before I go into the results, uh, I'd like to remind you quickly of what happens in the skin and what are the dendritic cell populations that you find there. There is actually four different types of dendritic cells found in a normal skin, healthy skin. There is Langeron cells in the epidermal layer, Type 1 dendritic cells, the cross-presenting dendritic cells, these are IRF8 dependent and uh, very uh, efficient at cross-presenting antigens. They are express XCR1 and CD207. And then uh, DC2s, DC2s uh, uh, that are found in skin in two different uh, um, uh, subsets, uh, expressing different levels of CD11B, CD11B high and low. But uh, these two populations are, are share the same developmental origin and are both IRF4 dependent. So which of these dendritics, we, we will look at these dendritic cells through the last uh, next few experiments. So what happens when we inject a, a label antigen into the ear skin of mice? We can find uh, this uh, same uh, antigen in the lymph, draining lymph node uh, two days later. And uh, you can see very easily by comparing the total lymph node cells from a PBS injected mouse with, uh, to a mouse injected with one of those pathogens that is uh, very easy to detect the fluorescence signal within the within the population of uh, cell population in the lymph node. And you can get on this population and then try to define what these cells are. And uh, uh, <clears throat> of course, there is different cells that can take up antigen, but we found that consistently across the three models that we compared, that there is, uh, we were finding monocytes, which were present in different proportions, inflammatory monocytes, which are LY6C positive, and then migratory dendritic cells, which are uh, MHC2 high. And in most cases, we're also CD326 negative and XCR1 negative, which defines them as migratory DC2s. And uh, the results for each of these uh, different uh, microorganisms are summarized here. The dendritic cell populations are the ones in blue and red. And you see that in each case, the dendritic cells that take up uh, each of these microorganisms are the DC2, so CD11B high or CD11B low in comparable proportions. And what varies across the models is actually the proportion of monocytes. So regardless of the type of microorganism, the same population of dendritic cells seems to be involved. Now, the fact that we can detect them by flow cytometry doesn't necessarily mean that uh, these are the dendritic cells that are doing the job. So what we decided to do after that is do a simple experiment, which is compare uh, different strains of mice in which we can delete a different population of dendritic cells. And uh, the results are here. <clears throat> These are mice where the Langeron cells in the epidermis were depleted by using diphtheria toxin treatment. And uh, in these mice, uh, there is also a loss of uh, type one dendritic cells. And as you can see, 
Mice were immunized with mycobacteria, nipostrongylus, or candida were able to generate immune responses of the appropriate type in each case, and these were not really affected by the depletion of Langerian, Langerian cells, suggesting that these cells were not playing a key role in the induction of the immune response. And this, a very similar result is also, we also found in the case of beta-3 knockout mice in which the migratory dendritic cells failed to develop uh, and are defective. Again, there are normal responses to each of these microorganisms uh, and in some cases even augmented. So these two subsets of dendritic cells don't seem to be playing a role. But the result is uh, quite different when we use the conditional knockout uh, mice uh, for IRF4, a transcription factor which is essential for the development of DC2s. And uh, what we find in this case, in these lymph nodes where the number of DC2s is very low, is that uh, the IL-17 response to candida and the IL-4 response to nipostrongylus was uh, almost uh, completely ablated. And uh, the interferon gamma response to mycobacteria was not as uh, strongly affected, but nonetheless, uh, the proportion of high interferon producer was uh, less than half compared to wild type mice. So the conclusion from this experiment is, uh, uh, the is that uh, regardless of the type of pathogen used, uh, the same population of dendritic cells was uh, involved in uptake and also in uh, uh, the induction of the appropriate uh, immune response. And this might be because these dendritic cells are very efficient at antigen uptake. This is uh, obviously important, but uh, importantly, it also suggests that these dendritic cells are able to change and uh, direct the immune response in different ways. And if this is the case, we should expect them to express different genes. And uh, this is an experiment that is still in progress, where we uh, purified the antigen positive dendritic cells from mice that were injected with either PBS, again, nipostrongylus candida of mycobacteria, and uh, used RNA sequencing, bulk RNA sequencing to characterize uh, their transcriptome. And uh, this is a PCA of the 10,000 top genes expressed by these different dendritic cells. And we found that uh, in each case, Antigen positive dendritic cells uh, cluster away from the PBS, uh, showing that they uh, uh, have started expressing different genes, of course. And they also cluster close to each other, but separately from each other, indicating that there are differences between the genes expressed in these cases. And uh, it is also interesting how the two subsets of dendritic cells, DC2s, are also clustering separately, regardless of whether they are antigen positive or not. They all express uh, a set of common genes, which are uh, shared by all uh, activated dendritic cells, but also specific genes that differentiate them. And we can uh, zoom in in some of these genes uh, that uh, we predict to be important, and we find, as we would expect, for example, dendritic cells uh, have taken up mycobacteria or candida express uh, IL-12 P40 at higher level co compared to PBS, while in the mice injected with nipostrongylus, this is not the case. And similarly, for example, uh, dendritic cells from mice injected with candida express uh, IL-23 P19, uh, P but this is not the case uh, in, uh, when dendritic cells are exposed to either nipostrongylus or, or mycobacteria. And of course, there is also many molecules that are expressed all across, such as costimulatory molecules and so on. So conclusion from this first part of the talk was, uh, is that uh, dendritic cells, uh, at least type two dendritic cells in skin, appear to be plastic. They can take up different types of microbial antigens and are essential for directing the CD4 response to different uh, cytokine profiles. And uh, this is uh, to us important. It means uh, that uh, if we want to try to understand what are the signals that uh, drive a TH2 immune response, we have to focus on those uh, molecules which are specifically expressed by dendritic cells loaded with an hypostrongulus brasiliensis compared to dendritic cells that have taken up other stimuli. And we look forward uh, to further studies that are ongoing in our lab to try to identify these molecules. <clears throat> 
And, you, and now I would like to switch a little bit. Uh, the reason why these experiments were done in the skin was uh, not by chance. Uh, it was uh, also for a second reason that we think the skin is important in the initiation of Th2 immune responses. And I'll go over this uh, quickly at the end. But uh, in any case, uh, one characteristic which is uh, of type two dendritic cells that is uh, really interesting and possibly not uh, as much studies that one would expect is the fact that uh, these dendritic cells have different phenotypes depending on the tissue they come from. So DC2s in the skin, as we just saw, can be divided into a CD11B high and a CD11B low population. Here it is. And this CD11 below population is found only in skin and not in the lung or small intestine. In contrast, for example, in the small intestine, there is a population of dendritic cells which expresses CD103 and uh, is not found in other tissues. So, and this dendritic cells is possibly the best study the, of, the, of this six subset and is uh, an important uh, uh, dendritic cell population for the induction of tolerance to food antigens and for the immune response to gut microbiota. So, the, the presence of these dendritic cells in the gut is important to the function, the immunological function of gut itself. And uh, this is demonstrated in this nice paper, which uh, shows that uh, the differentiation of these dendritic cells in gut requires TGF beta receptor signaling. And if uh, this TGF beta receptor signaling is uh, blocked, uh, mice become much more susceptible to intestinal inflammation and also do not develop uh, intraepithelial T cells. So the question was, uh, we have this uh, population unique to skin and uh, why is this population only found in skin? And uh, if uh, these dendritic cells are important to the intestinal function, are these dendritic cells similarly important for skin function? What can we learn by studying them in more detail? And to do this, we again took a, a transcriptomic approach. Simply, we uh, flow purified all these six populations from the lymph nodes uh, or draining the skin, the lung, or the small intestine, carry out bulk RNA sequencing, and with the idea of identifying genes that are specific for each subset, and then uh, by analyzing the promoter of these genes, try to predict uh, which uh, transcription factors might be activated in these cells and uh, what might drive the expression of those transcription factors, the activation of those transcription and function of those transcription factors. And this is the result of this experiment. <clears throat> this heat map, <clears throat> shows uh, genes uh, that are specific to either one or other of these uh, six dendritic cell subsets. And as you can see, the CD103 dendritic cells from the gut, which is a unique subset uh, compared to other tissues, express a unique set of genes that we don't find to be expressed at high level in any of the other dendritic cell subsets. And uh, similarly, our CD11 below dendritic cells in skin also express a set of genes that we find that to be low, that are lowly expressed in other DC subsets. So can we uh, use uh, this information to understand what drives the differentiation of these dendritic cells? So we did that, as I mentioned, by looking, uh, identifying transcription factors that might drive the expression of these genes. And uh, the results of this experiment uh, is here. You find that there are many transcription factors that are predicted to drive the expression of genes which are shared across all the different cluster, uh, clusters. And in the case of CD11 below dendritic cells, there were nine predicted transcription factors that might be responsible for their transcriptional profile, and they are listed here. And uh, what we found immediately surprising was uh, that among uh, several predictable, perhaps, uh, transcription factors such as IRF4, we found also STAT6, which was unexpected. So why is this? Uh, uh, surprising. Uh, STAT6 is uh, in a way a little bit special as a transcription factor because it has a very specific function, which is uh, to uh, mediate a signal transduction through the R4 and IL13 receptor, which are 13 receptors. So 
they, it's activated by two cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13, which are uh, normally thought to be involved in allergic immune responses and not part of uh, the environment that we would have expected dendritic cells to be exposed to in the skin. And uh, uh, dendritic cells express either of these receptors, both, the, both these receptors, the IL-4 receptor type 1 and the IL-13 or type 2 IL-4 receptor, and the fact that uh, they show a transcript, these dendritic cells from skin show a transcriptional, uh, a stat 6 transcriptional signature suggests that these cells have been exposed to these cytokines at some time during their differentiation. So, can we uh, identify the contribution of stat 6? Uh, what we did was uh, simply compare the dendritic cells from skin, lung, and small intestinal lymph node in a normal mouse to dendritic cells from a STAT6 knockout mouse. And as you can see, the phenotype of dendritic cells in lung or small intestine are the same, but in the skin of STAT6 knockout mice, the dendritic cell, the CD11B low dendritic cells that carry the STAT6 signature are missing. Uh, indicating that STAT6 ha also has this functional role. And we can look more closely at the populations of dendritic cells in this skin lymph node. We find that Langerhans cells and type 1 dendritic cells are not affected, are present in uh, with similar phenotype and in similar proportion in both strains. But in CD, in STAT6 knockout mice, the CD11 below dendritic cells are present in lower frequency, and this uh, loss of CD11B low cells seems to be compensated by an increase in the CD11B high. And uh, this is the case in skin lymph node and also in skin. So this lack of dendritic cells in the lymph node is not due to uh, lack of migration from tissues. Um, so um, we, I will not take you through all the experiments that we did to, to try and find out what was exactly was driving this uh, uh, STAT6 signaling. And to summarize, it was not uh, uh, the differentiation of this CD11 below dendritic cells did not require IL-4, but IL-13 was essential. And uh, expression of the IL-13 receptor alpha chain was also essential indicating that it was signaling through IL-13 and the IL-13 receptor that is necessary for the dif differentiation of the CD11 below dendritic cells. And uh, just uh, a couple of experiments uh, to show uh, the, the key uh, data that we have on this uh, are here. So here are mice uh, treat uh, IL-13 uh, NOCA mice that they were treated with PBS. And uh, as you can see, the CD11 below dendritic cells are missing and uh, the phenotype of the DC2 population is very similar to the one found in STAT6 NOCA mouse, mice. But uh, if we treat these mice with uh, an IL-13 fusion protein for four, day, four days, we find that, that we can rescue the differentiation of this population, uh, indicating that IL-13 can do this. And in fact, the fact that IL-13 is uh, uh, involved in the differentiation of this population is quite interesting because uh, a previous paper published a few years ago had described how uh, immune, uh, innate immune lymphocytes uh, uh, in uh, the skin of normal healthy mice always express an IL-13 reporter at low level and are also producing a, some, a low level of cytokines that is possible, uh, that can be measured uh, uh, in uh, skin lysates. And this uh, IL-13 is uh, strongly diminished or absent in mice where uh, innate lymphocytes fail to develop. And this uh, observation is completely consistent with our results as we find that in the skin, uh, dendritic cells, uh, innate lymphocytes can produce IL-13 a steady state uh, in the absence of infection and uh, in the absence of the uh, alarmists that normally drive uh, cytokine production by innate lymphocytes. But uh, the same population, which is also present in the of innate lymphocytes, which is also present in the lung or in the small intestine, 
uh, in these cases, these uh, innate lymphocytes do not express an IL13, explaining why this uh, CD11B low population of dendritic cells, which is found only in the skin uh, and requires IL13 production, uh, exposure to IL13 is not present either in the lung or the small intestine. And uh, so, and the uh, experiments that we have carried out also show that uh, depleting the uh, uh, innate lymphocytes uh, from the mouse uh, re uh, results in a decreased uh, uh, proportion of CD11 below dendritic cells. And uh, this, uh, this uh, picture is uh, based on uh, data from other scientists uh, from a review in current opinion in immunology. And uh, what we know about the location of these cells within the skin is that ILC2s are found uh, associated to the hair follicle and uh, a subset of dendritic cells in the skin is also found uh, in the same location. So it is plausible that the ILC2s uh, derived IL13 is accessible to the dendritic cells and drives their differentiation into CD11 below. So this is the summary of what I told you so far. Uh, in a healthy skin from wild type mice, uh, there is always a population of innate lymphocytes that is secreting IL13, a steady state and in, in healthy conditions. And this IL13 can act on uh, developing dendritic cells and uh, uh, drive them to acquire a CD11 below phenotype. If uh, IL13 is not present, if the dendritic cells are unable to respond to it, dendritic cells proceed to develop into we, what we think is a default pathway into CD11 high cells and the CD11 below dendritic cells are very few. So far I talked to, to you about mice, but of course uh, it's uh, important to remember that uh, uh, but to understand uh, what may happen happen in humans uh, as well, and uh, we have worked on CD11 below dendritic cells, mouse CD11 below dendritic cells for a while, and uh, I've often been asked with this question: Is there a, a corresponding disease subset uh, subset in human skin? Of course, the CD11B expression is not enough to uh, make this comparison, but now that we know, know that these dendritic cells express an IL-13 signature, we had uh, sufficient information to go and look for something more specific. And what we decided to do was uh, to uh, use uh, transcriptomic data generated by other group and, uh, groups and already published and try to uh, uh, identify whether there is an IL-13 signature in skin dendritic cells compared to dendritic cells from another tissue such as blood or spleen, and whether this signature is uh, restricted to skin dendritic cells or whether it is also present in dendritic cells from other uh, parts of the body. And uh, again, and these are the titles of the studies uh, from which we took data. And uh, the results of this experiment, again, are here. Uh, this is, of course, uh, simply a, a, a silico analysis, uh, uh, and uh, the data will have to be confirmed experimentally. But uh, if we look at uh, the reactome pathways, the signaling pathways that are uh, enriched in this data set, so we find uh, many uh, reactome pathways. And uh, four are enriched uh, in all the dendritic subsets from skin and not in the one from well, one study on lung. And uh, we were very pleased to find uh, that of all uh, the signal, these four signaling pathway, the top one was indeed IL-4 and IL-13 signaling, suggesting that dendritic cells in human, normal human skin are exposed to a similar environment to what found, is found in the mouse. So we find the IL-13 signature in uh, uh, the dendritic cells. Where does uh, the IL-13 come from? Uh, this study that was published uh, last year suggests that uh, in human skin, we can also find ILCs, uh, and uh, they are found in the upper dermis. And these are, uh, this is a healthy donor. These are healthy donors, and they are increased, as one might expect, in the skin of uh, patients with an allergic disease, such as atopic dermatitis. And when characterized by uh, RNA sequencing, these dendritics, uh, these uh, uh, innate lymphocytes uh, 
which express a lot of uh, cytokines in, uh, during allergic disease, which is expected, express much low le lower level of cytokines, but still express some IL-13, even a steady state. So in human skin, we can find the uh, freshly explanted uh, ILCs that express IL-13. So <clears throat> confirming uh, the signature data. And uh, what about the function? What, what does, does this matter? Does this IL-13 uh, production in skin have uh, an impact on the ability of dendritic cells to generate immune responses? So to address this question, we uh, used uh, some mice, in which, conditional knockout mice, in which uh, the R4 dendritic cells uh, lack our expression of the R4 receptor and are therefore unable to respond to IL-13 and also IL-4. And we used uh, our model that I described in the first part of my talk to assess the ability of uh, these mice to generate different types of immune responses. And as shown here, uh, mice immunized with mycobacteria were able to generate uh, interferon gamma responses. And these were basically undistinguishable regardless of whether the dendritic cells uh, expressed the R4 receptor or not. And the same in the ca case of IL-17A and candida immunization. If anything, there is a stronger response in, the, in mice where uh, dendritic cells do not express IL-4 receptor. And again, uh, the picture is different when we look at the response to uh, Nipostrongylus brasiliensis. And here we find that uh, the percentage of cells that produce, express IL-4 or IL-13 or the, uh, or the GATA, GATA3 transcription factor, which is typical of Th2 cells, in each case, these IL-4, IL-13 and GATA3 positive cells uh, differentiate uh, at a lower rate in mice in which uh, dendritic cells are unable to respond to IL-13. So their ability to initiate Th2 immune responses is defective. And uh, this is not because dendritic cells have left the lymph, uh, sorry, this is not because the lymphocytes, the Th2 cells have left the lymph node. If we check the spleen of the same mice, we find that, that in the spleen as well, uh, there is uh, a lower proportion of uh, GATA3 positive cells if diseases are unresponsive, unresponsive to IL-13. And we can also show that uh, this defect in uh, generating Th2 immune responses is specific to the skin and is not found in the lung. So if we take mice and immunize them with uh, house dust mite allergen via skin injection, we find uh, a decrease uh, in the response, uh, the Th2 response uh, to the allergen, similar to what we find after immunization with nipple. If we gave this same dose of Hunter's mite via intranasal immunization, we find that, that there is the same response regardless. So the ability of these dendritic cells in skin to respond to IL-13 has made them better able to initiate Th2 immune responses. And this is a tissue specific effect. Why this is the case very briefly, because we don't know what the what are the important signals in driving Th2 immune responses? We couldn't look too, in too much depth, but we could at least look at the activation of these cells. And we know that uh, dendritic cells in a normal mouse, uh, where R4 receptor is expressed on all cells, uh, dendritic cells that take up nipple antigen upregulate uh, co-stimulatory signals such as CD86 and PDL2. And this upregulation is more marked in the CD11 below dendritic cells compared to the CD11 B high. And if now we compare this expression to expression in mice where dendritic cells are unresponsive to IL-13, we find that, that while the CD11 B high behave exactly like the CD11B high or very similarly to the CD11B high in a normal mouse, the few CD11B low that are left are basically unable to uh, respond uh, fully and uh, behave more like the CD11B high. So there is a defect in this dendritic cell population to respond to allergen. Uh, and this uh, summarizes, just adds uh, that uh, the lack of this population of CD11 below uh, has an impact on the Th2 response, the ability of mice to generate Th2 immune responses. 
Okay, so, so far I showed you what happens in the lymph node. We have not looked at uh, allergic inflammation as such, but uh, does this uh, uh, production of IL-13 in skin impact on the ability to mount inflammatory immune responses to allergens? <clears throat> and for this, I have a simple experiment that is still unpublished, uh, which uh, was uh, <clears throat> carried out by taking normal mice. Now we are talking about C57 black mice, no conditional mutant or, or anything. And these mice were exposed to house dust mite, uh, the same dose of house dust mite, either by uh, injection into the ear or by intranasal administration. And uh, the same mice were exposed again to a house dust mite. Uh, all the mice, regardless of house dust mite or PBS priming, were exposed again to house dust mite by intranasal immunization twice. And then uh, on day 14, uh, this um, uh, allergy, uh, inflammatory cells in the lung were recovered using bronchoalveolar lavage and uh, immune cells in lung uh, were uh, assessed by flow cytometry. And we also measured IgE in the serum. And what we found in this experiment is that uh, uh, priming with house dust mite via the intradermal route is very effective at inducing allergic inflammation in the, the lung. There is a, a higher number of inflammatory cells in the airspace. Uh, there is a higher proportion of eosinophils compared to the PBS and a higher number of eosinophils. And, uh, there is also a significant difference compared to mice that we are primed to the same allergen via the intranasal route, a much lower cellularity, although there are some eosinophils, but their total number is much, much lower than compared to the intradermal priming, indicating that exposure via airway is less effective at inducing an allergic response. And in fact, if we look for IL-4 or IL-13 producing cells in the lung of these mice, they have undergone this treatment at the time of, the, of this measurement, we find that, that there is many more IL-4, IL-13, and IL-4 and IL-13 double producer cells after intradermal immunization in the lung of mice that were uh, immunized intradermally compared to mice that were immunized intranasally. And to finish, IgE is also higher. Total uh, serum IgE is higher in mice immunized intradermally compared to ones uh, immunized intranasally. So summary and conclusion for uh, the second part uh, of the talk uh, about the skin. We have identified the IL-13 as, as a skin niche factor that is produced at steady state by dermal ILCs. And uh, I didn't show you the data. This uh, production of uh, IL-13 does not require microbiota, doesn't require tissue alarms. We still do not know whether there is a signal that drives this production and what it is. And uh, we knew that uh, there is some IL-13 made in the skin, but we were not uh, aware of what the biological role is. And we have found one, at least, uh, at least one so far. And uh, this IL-13 production is uh, unique to skin, is not found in lung or small intestine, and uh, drives the differentiation of a skin unique population of dendritic cells, which is uh, skewed. Uh, uh, to uh, prime uh, Th2 immune cells. And uh, signaling, uh, IL-13 signaling uh, to, for the differentiation of CD11 below dendritic cells uh, requires STAT6 and KLF4 expression in the dendritic cells. And as a consequence of this mechanism, skin dendritic cells are highly effective at sensitizing to uh, allergic inflammatory responses. So I'd like to conclude with one last uh, couple of slides uh, to try to put uh, these findings of IL-13 into context. Uh, what does it mean to the bigger picture of trying to understand Th2 immune responses to allergens? We know that allergic disease is a significant uh, health uh, issue, affects many people, sometimes severely. It can uh, really impact on the quality of life. And we still do not understand why some of us become allergic and some don't, and uh, what are the uh, what is the immunological mechanism that uh, underlies uh, allergy uh, induction? 
So we have found that in the skin, there is always a production of IL-13 by innate lymphocytes. And this IL-13, as I said several times, drives the condition that conditions the local dendritic cells uh, being better at inducing Th2 immune responses. And uh, we know that uh, the ILC2s, of course, are not only present in the skin, are also found in other tissues, such as the lung, but a steady state, uh, these dendritic, uh, these ILC2s do not make IL-13 and the dendritic cells are not conditioned by that. However, in the appropriate conditions, ILC2s are able to produce IL-13, and this is when uh, the, the tissues is exposed uh, to allergens uh, that uh, express proteases that have protease function as uh, is, uh, for example, papain, a commonly used allergen, or uh, when during infection to helminth parasites, which burrows through the skin and therefore, therefore induce tissue damage. This tissue damage results in the production of alarmins such as IL-33, TSLP, and IL-25, and the, the exposure to the cytokines drives ILC2 to um, express IL-13 and condition dendritic cells uh, to uh, initiate a Th2 immune responses. And this is reported in this a very elegant paper published a few years ago. This means that uh, in other tissues, uh, this uh, process is well uh, regulated and, uh, and uh, is dependent on this protease function of allergens, which uh, as of today is the best uh, working definition we have of what is an allergen, something that can induce damage, the production of uh, alarmins, IL-13 and the uh, activation of dendritic cells into a TH2 inducing phenotype. So at this point, we have to consider how do we see the skin. In the skin, this uh, mechanism is basically switched on all the time. So anything, regardless of whether they have protease activity or not, uh, in theory, can be an allergen. And I would like to uh, propose that uh, allergens for which we are not able to demonstrate uh, protease activity, such as uh, is, uh, milk, for example, or perhaps eggs, uh, might become allergens because we are exposed to them through the skin rather than by ingesting them uh, due to this predisposition of the skin to, to allergic immune responses. And uh, this is interesting because uh, we know that uh, there is an association, a well-established association between uh, uh, loss of skin barrier function as is found uh, in uh, individuals that uh, carry some mutations in uh, proteins that are found at the uh, skin surface and uh, make the skin impermeable. Uh, mutation in these genes uh, is associated with uh, increased susceptibility to uh, allergic disease and especially food allergy. We presume that, of course, IL-13 will also have a beneficial function for skin if we have uh, uh, this mechanism both in mice and in humans. And uh, whether this is to protect us from skin penetrating parasites at the time where our ancestors were walking around the barefoot, or to avoid biting insects or keep away mites, or perhaps to support skin repair is something that we still don't know and we need to establish. Um, it will be interesting to find out. So I would like to finish at this point and uh, by thanking all uh, my group and collaborators that have done all the work I presented today. First uh, part of the talk was a where experiment uh, carried out by Carrie Hilligan which, when she was a PhD student in the lab. The second part uh, was uh, uh, mainly uh, work of uh, Johannes Meyer, who did all the cellular work uh, on IL-13 and CD11 below dendritic cells, and Olivier, who instead uh, led uh, the molecular biology work. And of course, we had lots of support uh, so from many groups uh, at the Malagan Institute and uh, uh, all over the world that provided reagents and so on. And thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to the questions on Twitter. Thank you, Franca, for such a wonderful presentation. I think that's really highlighted to us all, not only the uh, complexity between DC populations, but such heterogeneity between tissues. Thank you. So 
if you stop sharing for a second, we will just, thank you, we'll put up the slide, um, which just lets everybody know um, how they can ask you questions on your talk. So um, if everybody um, goes to, uh, they can use the Q&A by Twitter. So if you search for our account, Global Arena Talks, find the tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Franca, Dr. Franca Ron Seth Kese here, and then reply to that tweet um, with your question, mentioning the hashtag Global Immunotalk. Franca has kindly agreed to answer your questions on Twitter, and um, I'm sure we'll do so for a little bit and longer than the talk, just for those of us um, not on the right time zone or people who are watching in their own time. Um, please get on your, put on your questions um, when you can. So this just leaves me to remind everybody, next week um, our speaker will be Lei Guan Un, so um, tune in for that. And again, that leads me to thank Franco one more time for such a wonderful talk and for taking us through such a tour de force of uh, DC biology. We really appreciate it. So um, thank you so much. And um, we'll close there and um, see everybody next time. Thank you.